I'm Dave Mitchell, uh, one of the pastors here at Calvary Church, and it's a privilege to be able to bring portions of God's Word that sometimes are maybe overlooked or uh, we don't get into some of the details as much as we might want on other occasions, uh, although we often do. But uh, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to share God's Word with you here. And uh, typically it's a Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, but uh, fortunately sort of the quote-unquote on-demand element of video recording this makes it available for you at any time that's convenient for you. And maybe you don't have a half an hour to sit there. Uh, maybe you take it in 10-minute bites and over three sessions you be able to gain it all as well. We are on the book of Daniel, and uh, it's a book that Daniel wrote. He was held captive by the Babylonian power. It overtook the uh, country of Judah, which is the southern tribe of the nation of Israel. In about 605 B.C., he's taken captive into Babylon. He's about a 15-year-old kid about that time, and uh, he's a remarkable young man that we can learn from, no matter what our age is, that we would have the kind of maturity that he has. We've been through Daniel 1 and part of Daniel 2 last week, and in Daniel chapter 2, the storyline is this, and just to help us to catch up, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king that has taken Daniel captive in 605 B.C., Daniel does not have a bitter attitude. He's not angry. He's not frustrated. He's not protesting. He's simply doing what God calls him to do, to live an obedient and faithful life to what God has designed him to be as a young Jewish man and his friends that are there gathered together. And uh, they're part of the sort of a wise men of the king's council. And the king has had a dream. And uh, he wants his wise men, the, the Babylonian wise men, to tell him not only what the dream means, but tell him what the dream is. And they said, there is nobody that can do that. And then Daniel hears about that and says, I, I think I can do that. Because he knows he's been gifted by God to understand and have insights into those visions. So that's where we pick up in Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to pick up in Daniel 2.19. And uh, if you want more about that, you can look at last week's lesson. And by the way, we do have the outlines online now, and uh, there was a little technical problem, so we're glad to get that uh, fixed as well. But Daniel 2, chapter 2, verse 19, Daniel is blessing God for giving him insight about this vision. He says, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. Again, the vision of the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. And if they don't tell him what the dream is, as well as the interpretation of the dream, they're all going to be torn limb from limb. Their homes are going to be destroyed. Uh, that's what you call pressure. And so here he is. God has revealed it to him. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. For wisdom and power belong to him. So he's giving God the credit. Daniel says, I couldn't do this on my own. God had to do it. For it is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He's in control. All these things under his power. And knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God, my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you. He had gone to his three friends and said, let's pray about this, that God would show them compassion. And God then revealed to him what that dream is, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So Daniel then goes to the person who is uh, giving all this bad news to them, Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Well, then Arioch, he hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah. That's unique. I've got one of these kids that you stole away from Jerusalem, and he is the one, not your wise men of Babylon, that can reveal this to you. And so he's brought one of the exiles of Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. And the king said to Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, as you might recall from Daniel 1, they gave them Babylonian names, so their identity is not with Yahweh, their God. Their identity is with the Babylonian gods, and that's part of the the trickery and the deceit of the culture of this world, to change our identity as to not one who follows the Lord, but one who is part of the cultural makeup of the world around us. And so that's that name, Belshazzar. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation? Make known the dream and its interpretation. And Daniel answered before the king and said, 
As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. No man is able to come up with this on his own. This is not something human ability is able to achieve. And so he says to them, however, there is a God in heaven. So he's pointing Nebuchadnezzar to the Yahweh, God in heaven, that Daniel and his friends worship and honor and obey. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. So this dream takes us into the future of your life, King Nebuchadnezzar. This was on your dream. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were in bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me by any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man. Notice the humility of Daniel. I can't do this. It's what God has blessed me with. We should always hold those things that God has given to us in this world very loosely recognizing that's not what I did, but what God chose to do in and through me. So I love his, Daniel's heart, residing in me any more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king, that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. So Nebuchadnezzar's thinking, I wonder what's going to happen after me. He thinks he's such a hot, big, powerful man, and of course he was. He could kill all of his wise men, and there's, there's no impeachment of the Nebuchadnezzar kingdom. And so he has full power. But Daniel reveals that there is a God of heaven that has more power, that knows everything that's in your heart, Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to reveal to you what you were dreaming. I'm going to reveal to you the interpretation of the dream. And this is one of the beautiful aspects of this book in Daniel chapter 2. So we're getting into this area where Daniel has a courageous heart in a very chaotic time. And as a reminder, uh, here is what Romans 15, 4 tells us. These things are not just isolated things that are sort of fanciful stories, maybe made up, maybe fictional, but no, they were written by God so that we, as Romans 15, 4 says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Why? So that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Because God knows we'll go through chaotic times. Not as chaotic, maybe, as what Daniel was going through, where if he didn't get it right, he's going to be killed. But there are chaotic, chaotic times, obviously, this year. We've seen all kinds of crazy things last year and still in this year. And so we want to have a perseverance through those things and encouragement in the midst of those things and have hope that God is still in charge. God is in control. So here's Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, as you notice on my little timeline. He's, he's uh, 17 years old. And uh, so, you know, it's just remarkable to think of a young man that age with this much faith, this much maturity, this much humility, and uh, this much dependence on God. So it's a remarkable young man. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that, so that's why he, frankly, is in his court at this time and been given that opportunity. But one of the key things that's coming out of this passage is that God controls the kingdoms. God is in charge. That's what it says in Daniel 2, 19 through 30. And then verse 37, a little bit later, You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Nebuchadnezzar, this isn't because of who you are. And he, frankly, and in, in, he, in, he inherited this kingdom from his father. Uh, so it's not like he worked his way into it, but he was given this kingdom. But ultimately, God gave him this kingdom. And the question might be asked, you know, why would God give to King Nebuchadnezzar, this wicked king, a kingdom like this that ravaged the Jewish people in Judah? Uh, well, there is an answer to that. We've talked about it. And that's because God says, I have appointed Nebuchadnezzar to come and take you captive so your land can have the 70 Sabbath years that you never obeyed me in, because for 490 years, the tribe of Judah and the nation of Israel, in essence, had not practiced the Sabbath year. So for 70 years, from 605 to about 597 or so BC, they're going to be held captive so the Sabbath rest will be given to the land. This is why God gave to Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom. And so Daniel knew that. He can read Jeremiah. Jeremiah is the one that spells that all out for us. And we've looked at that passage as well. So here's five examples in this particular passage of the dream and the interpretation of the dream to show that God is in control. So 
The things that are in the future is what Daniel is going to give to King Nebuchadnezzar. He sees an image. God somehow makes this image known. And uh, he talks about this image here of a great statue. And uh, somebody came up with this, the head of gold that is Babylon. We're going to talk about this. And then there's the silver that is in this area that is Medo-Persia, as you will see. The bronze is the area of Greece. And uh, then the king north and the south. We'll talk about that when we get to those later chapters. And then the final area, the iron, the iron clay that is down here, that is the power of Rome. And then finally, a kingdom that will not be destroyed. That's the vision. That's what Daniel saw. And God told him, this is what's going on. And uh, let me just back up to something I said, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there are some people that do not believe that Daniel wrote the book of Daniel in 605 B.C. or 500, in the middle years of 500 B.C. Because how could he have possibly have known that these are the kingdoms that's going to follow King Nebuchadnezzar? How could anybody know that? How could I tell you in the next a thousand years what the United States and other kingdoms will be around this world? I couldn't possibly know that, but God knows that. God spells that out. God controls that. God appoints kingdoms and kings. And uh, so some people believe that Daniel did not write it. He, this book had, had obviously had to have been written about 165 B.C. when he could look back and say, well, here's the kingdoms that have then come out of King Nebuchadnezzar, so therefore we can sort of import them back in time as to the time that Daniel lived, because he couldn't have known that. And, and the whole idea of this, what is called higher criticism, to evaluate who authored these books, when were they written, and so forth, it's a whole science that goes on. But those in the liberal, sort of the non-supernatural, sort of the anti-God type of uh, thinking that goes on with some of that uh, uh, process, they don't believe that God is the God of the supernatural, and some people even take away some of the miracles that Jesus did. They just don't believe in the supernatural uh, power of God to reveal to a young 17-year-old kid the vision of all the kingdoms that we're going to follow. So that's why we believe that when Daniel lived, Daniel wrote this, Daniel recorded this, and uh, all of his life is part of that ministry to us today, according to Romans 15, 4, uh, that we would receive that instruction and have perseverance and encouragement with hope. And so that's what we want to look at. So let's look at the statue. There are these nations that he is describing. First of all, the head of gold, it says, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue was, which was large and extraordinary splendor was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. And so that word was very popular back in Daniel's day as well. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. And so that's the top part. Daniel is saying, you are the top. You are the most powerful. Gold is the most valuable of metals that this uh, statue has. So King Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, you're, you're very powerful. And King Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian kingdom, they ruled from 627 to 539 B.C., roughly, when King Cyrus then took over. And the second part of this uh, vision that he looks at the statue is not only that he had a head of gold, but that there was, uh, secondly, this chest and arms of silver. And uh, this becomes the next nas national power that takes over in the world. It's the Medes and the Persians. There's these two elements, the two arms, if you will, uh, that reflect this kingdom that came along. And the Medes and the Persians actually had power from 539 B.C. And we'll look at, I've talked about King Cyrus a lot. Uh, because Isaiah predicted that King Cyrus would come back in 700 B.C. King Cyrus then comes along and he rules at this time because King Cyrus is the one who commissioned the rebuilding of the, of the city of Jerusalem, the temple that's in the uh, city of Jerusalem. So it's re remarkable again. But God says, I already know that King Cyrus is going to be born. Isaiah has already named him by name. But God says, I, I just want you to know that I am in charge of these kingdoms as they rise up and as they fall down. And so this chest and arms of... of, of uh, of uh, silver that is taking place. And it's interesting because Daniel in his own book tells us who that kingdom is. As we read in Daniel chapter 5, we'll get to it a little bit later, God still gives them more visions. But there even in Daniel 5, it says, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. So it's not a mystery. It's not something we're sort of concocting based on history. It's something that Daniel in his own lifetime was saying, the Medes and the Persians are going to come up and they're going to overpower you someday. And uh, they will be the powers that will be at place. 
Uh, that's going to be about 539 B.C. They didn't name the date, but they knew that that's the national power. And this is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians that shows you it's pretty massive uh, of the area that they took over. And here's this wonderful little town, city, Susa. Those of you who are uh, students of the book of Esther will recognize that. That's where Esther eventually uh, was part of. The Jewish people were taken in that particular area, and she, she became instrumental in saving the Jewish people from extermination that was taking place. And uh, Daniel even, in fact, sees himself in Susa as well, as we'll see that as we go through the book of Daniel. But here's Babylon, and this is where Daniel was. He eventually lands here. Of course, Esther is there. And so you see some of the, some of the connections of the books of the Bible as these powers come into place. The third power that's in this uh, statue, if you will, is the belly and the thighs of bronze. It's the area of Greece. And uh, in fact, uh, it's no mystery. Alexander the Great, one of the powerful men in the history of, of mankind. Daniel chapter 8 tells us this. He said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of indignation. We'll talk about that when we get to Daniel chapter 8. For it pertains to the appointed time of the end. The ram which you saw with the two horns, this is another vision that God gave to him. In fact, Gabriel, the, king, the uh, angel, if you will, explains these things. Wouldn't you love to have an angel come and just and tell you, well, here's what God's going to do. You know, <laughs> this is what's next. I'd love to have an angel come and explain it all to me. Fortunately, we have the revelation of God's word that helps us with that beyond just what an angel would say. But an angel, Gabriel, comes and says, the two horns represent the kings of the Medes and the Persians, and that's what we just saw. But the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And so already Daniel is recognizing that, boy, it's, it's uh, Babylon, it's the Medes and the Persians. Now Greece is going to come into power. Greece? You know, it's just unthinkable at, those, at that time that Daniel lived. But uh, G uh, Gabriel makes this known to him. The large horn that is between the eyes is the first king. And we'll talk more about that. This is just gets so into the weeds sometimes, but I hope you hang in there with us. Because it's just miraculous. It's miraculous how God reveals his control over the kings and the kingdoms and the timing of the kingdoms, and that there is no surprise in this history, but it's also something that I think can be magnified to realize there's no surprise to God about who's the president of the United States right now. God is in control of all the kingdoms, and he has a plan that we will see be taking place. And here's the Greek kingdom that shows the, part, the uh, area that was under his uh, Alexander the Great as he took over so much territory and began to plow through that. And then finally, there is the nation of Rome that comes up. In Daniel 2, 40 through 45, and uh, it says this, and I haven't been reading through the text. You can read through the text yourself because there's so much here. But in verse 40, it says, Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these pieces. So Rome comes along and begins to have this power play over all these areas that are under display here. And here is Rome, just massive. And it's all this Roman power. And of course, the Romans are the part of who were helping kill Jesus. And, uh, and yet their Roman roads allowed Paul to travel up here in an area we call Turkey today. It was called Asia Minor, Ephesus and some of those cities, Colossae. Uh, that we read about Ephesians and Colossians and so forth. And so he had power there. And of course, Greece, they had control over this area. And this is where Paul uh, had traveled. We see that in the book of Acts. And of course, in Rome, and he's held in a prison there as well. So you can see, these are the, these are the places that, that God knew was going to be in control. God knew that when Jesus was born in the world, Rome would be in rule. Rome would demand the census. And that census would cause Mary and Joseph to go from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. God had all that in charge of his control, and so nothing surprises him. We can rest in the control that is God's. I love this about Leupold. Leupold is a, one of the commentators I have in my library. And, and let me, before I read Leupold, it says in verse 41, In that you saw that the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it toughness of iron as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw that the iron mixed with common clay, they will be combined with one another in, in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another even as iron does not combine with pottery. So Rome has this power, but it doesn't mix well with the populace. They want it to be united, but it's not united. They're a divided nation. 
there was a lot of rebellion against the Roman rule. Uh, no one was particularly thrilled, although they did wonderful things. They had great road, roads that uh, allowed the gospel to be shared. But there was a power struggle of the Roman rulers over the common citizens, especially the Jewish people. Leupold says this, on the fact that iron is the strongest, the Roman legions were noted for their ability to crush all resistance with an iron heel. There is apparently little that is constructive in the program of this empire in spite of the Roman law, Roman roads, and civilization because the destructive work outweighed all else. For we have the double verb, verb crush and demolish. You know, you can have a lot of great things, economy, roads, and civilization, and, and the sophistication of such as it was in those Roman times. But if you have to crush with a totalitarian way the will of people who rebel, you don't have a great kingdom, you don't have a great country. And so it's kind of a warning for us even for today. But it's interesting how the, the iron and the clay never mixed, it never became fixture, and Rome then imploded over time. And uh, that's kind of the warning for a church. If you're not united and there's rebellion, it's, it's tough to build that church and to build that community, to build that city, to build that home, that family. Division, lack of unity, is a devastating long-term result that comes. And so God is giving us that warning. So here's this statue that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had. This is, in, you know, obviously we don't know that that's the real one, but that's essentially what he described. And it shows, shows this power base and the various kingdoms that came and went over the course of time. But there's one last kingdom that he des describes in Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. And that's a long time. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel says, I, I want to take you beyond Rome. This is what God revealed to me, that there is another kingdom that will never be destroyed. It's not like Rome. It's not like Greece. It's not like the Persians or the Babylonians. It's, it's God's kingdom. And, of course, he's talking about a future, future to us. And uh, Daniel could have known all these things as we understand it. As we look back, we can see historically, yes, these are the kingdoms that took place. But there's another kingdom. And it says, this, and I highlight in yellow, a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver. The idea that this stone uh, is, is powerful like a mountain, and it destroys all other nations that try to have power over us. So this is what Christ came in this world to do. Christ is described as the stone. Paul writes in Ephesians, 2.20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself becomes or being the corner stone. But even more clearly, Peter writes this. You know, Peter, you know, he's the rock. He supposedly is the rock of the church. Acts 2, he became the foundation of the church in so many ways. Christ is the cornerstone. Christ is the foundation. But Peter is known as the, the rock, right? And so he says, I'm not the rock. I'm not the stone in the sense that you sometimes make me out to be. There's only one who is the stone. And this is where uh, you cross-reference from Daniel chapter 2 all the way to Peter, 1 Peter 2. It says, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious corner stone. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. The precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Christ is a powerful stone. He would defeat the enemies, like the nations of Rome and Babylon, Persia and Greece, and today and in the future. He will rule over all of them. Revelation 19, 20, he comes back, establishes a new kingdom that will be forever. And uh, so when Daniel talks about the stone, he, he may not have known that he's referencing the Messiah. But there's insight for us today as we look back. 
that Christ is still in charge. And someday he'll establish a kingdom on earth. Christ will be the uh, Messiah, the king. He's, uh, when he came on earth, he was a prophet, then became a priest on our behalf. Someday he will be the king, literally the king of the earth. And this is as the scriptures define it, the new kingdom that will be established on earth until God comes and makes a new heaven and a new earth. And we can talk more about that later. But here's what, what I think would be three applications from this, maybe four on the outline that you have. And the first is this, that God really desires to control all of our personal kingdoms, our little K kingdoms of our lives. I, I love the way King Nebuchadnezzar then responds. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and a fragrant incense. I love this. He, he kneels in this worshipful, prayerful thanksgiving to God, that, that he recognizes that God is the one, as Daniel said in verse 21, it is God who changes the times of the epics. He removes kings and he establishes kings. There's something vulnerable about Nebuchadnezzar's calloused, hard, brutal, destructive life. <laughs> and we'll see more of that when we get into the next couple of chapters. I love kind of that, that little crack into that vulnerability of Nebuchadnezzar's heart as he recognizes that, that Daniel, you couldn't have known what this dream is, but that your God told you. And so he kneels in this worshipful prayer. The second thing that I notice from this passage is that we need to trust and understand God's future plans through Jesus Christ. In verses 44 through 45, we saw that, that the kingdom that will come, it is forever, it is established forever, and the God of heaven will set up that kingdom. He will not be destroyed. No matter what happens in the chaotic world around us, God is still in charge. That's one of the things that Romans 15, 4, we want to encourage us that there's hope in the midst of some of the things we experience. And then we need to humbly submit our lives to the one true God. This is where we see this. And the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. This is a tremendous witness. Daniel's faithfulness in eating the dietary laws of Israel and not the king didn't compromise and he he had an outstanding testimony to the people around him in those days. Here he is allowing his gifts to be used by God, and he's still an outstanding witness that your God is a God of gods. There is no one greater than your God. It took a while for Nebuchadnezzar to really get that drilled down, and God will make sure he remembers it as we see in the future. But he's a God of gods, a Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many gifts, made him a ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of, of Babylon. Uh, that's a pretty big, powerful trip of a 17-year-old Jewish boy, you know? And so Daniel would have had no idea when he was taken captive in 605 B.C. that God said, you know, a couple of years you hang in there, you be faithful to me. I'm going to give you a little reward. You can have power because I need for you to have power in this Babylonian kingdom that I have appointed for 70 years to keep your people uh, away from the land so that there can be the 70 years of Sabbath rest. See, remember all the big context of all that God is doing beyond Babylon and beyond Daniel and the lion's den, the fiery furnace, things like that. And so, and Daniel made a request to the king and he says, I've got three friends with me. We met them before. And Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is the Babylonian names of these three friends. We talked about that in Daniel 1. I want them to be over the administration of the province of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. I want my three friends to also be promoted. And so this is God's blessing. You know, it doesn't always work out that way. You don't always get the promotion. You don't always get the gifts. You don't always get the power. But notice how Daniel is so blessed by God as Daniel works, as God works through King Nebuchadnezzar. And there's one last thing I put on the outline that it's important for us to remember. Why did God allow Daniel to be there and to have such a position as that? The bigger picture is that God is not done with the Jewish people. God wants to have his people in places of power and influence to protect the Jewish population. And so that's why the Daniel is there. And you, when you read later about Esther, that's why Esther was there. She becomes that intercessor, if you will, for such a time as this, that the Jewish people are protected. So all th throughout history, God is constantly protecting the Jewish people. And we've seen the terrible persecution, the anti-Semitic things that go on, 
But God always has his people in, in sight, and he always has his people in power in ways that can control and care for them. Jesus will come back, and he will gather together all of his people, including the Jewish and the Gentile people, so they can have that kingdom that will last forever. We can trust our God. We can trust he is the God of gods, as King Nebuchadnezzar said. But the important thing is that you and I, we live our lives like that, that that he is in charge. I don't need to struggle on my own. I can have perseverance, but I can also be encouraged to have the Romans 15, 4 hope that no matter what happens in the chaos around us, I'm going to walk faithfully like Daniel because I know that God is still in charge. He's still the same God as in Daniel's day, as in our day, no matter what happens around us. And I pray God blesses us with that ability. Next week, Daniel chapter 3. It's an amazing chapter uh, that shows the miraculous working power of God for those three friends. So please join us next week again. Let me pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that can be ours. Thank you for the ability to think, to reason, to study. And I pray to grow, to trust you as a God who is in charge, controlling nations and powers. And so anything we bring to you is much smaller usually. So thank you for your control in our little K kingdoms as well. And we pray that we'd walk faithfully like Daniel. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.